everyone. Thank you for joining me here today at the Cancer Support Community for the second talk of our series. For those of you who are, might not be familiar with the series, it started earlier this year with Bonnie Brown presenting Nutrition 101. This recording by myself, Lori Fertel, will discuss dietary supplements for cancer survivors. The following lecture by Kayla Hansman will discuss nutritional myths and truths. And we will end our lecture series with Lisa Andrews speaking on the topic of weight management. For all of us here at the cancer support community, the goal is to ensure that all people impacted by cancer are empowered by knowledge, strengthened by action, and sustained by community. So today I'm hoping to provide you with some information on dietary supplements and whether or not they are good for you. But before I begin to discuss the topic of supplements, I would like to give you some background information about myself. I grew up in Massachusetts and attended the University of Massachusetts in Amherst where I received my degree in clinical nutrition. And then after graduating from college, I moved to Cincinnati where I completed my dietetic internship at the University of Cincinnati Medical Center. Prior to starting my freshman year in college, I was diagnosed with melanoma, and I was very fortunate that it was caught early and treated early. But it was from that experience that I started to develop my interest in healthy lifestyles, and it's the result of that that, that I became a dietitian because I wanted to do everything I could to keep myself healthy and learning how to eat seemed like one of the first logical steps. And at different points in my life, I too have used supplements and as a result, I became very interested and that's why I'm doing this talk today. So what is a supplement? Well, according to the Food and Drug Administration or the FDA, a supplement is a product that is added to the diet that is taken orally in order to increase vitamin, mineral, herbal, botanical, amino acid, enzyme intake, and other nutritive and dietary substances. And the definition of this evolved in 1994 with the formation of the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act, which was an amendment to the original Food and Drug and Cosmetic Act. And so it was at this point that we've already used supplements now for um, three quarters of a century, but this is what really kind of kick-started the whole supplement revolution. And, and now we have an official definition of what a supplement is and people are starting to take them more seriously. So now that the supplement world has our attention, who are they marketing towards? Well, as I stated earlier, when I was in college, I started to take supplements because I wanted to stay healthy and I wanted to have all the energy that I needed to get things done that I needed to do. And the National Health and Nutrition Survey went through and evaluated in general who, who uses supplements. And what they found is it's primarily older women who are of a higher education and income level, and they also tend to be non-smokers. Now, specifically amongst cancer survivors, breast cancer survivors have the highest supplement use, which makes sense based upon what I just said, that generally it's the women who tend to use supplements more, but followed by the breast cancer survivors, um, prostate, colon, and lung cancer, cancer survivors respectively also tend to use supplements. So in total, up to 81% of cancer survivors do use some type of additional vitamin or mineral nutrient supplement in their diet. And most of them start doing this after their initial diagnosis. So why do we take supplements? Well, like I said, when I was in college, I wanted to have more energy. So that's basically, you know, one of the main reasons people, they would just want to feel good and they, they want to improve their quality of life. They want to be able to have the get up and go that they need to have in order to get the things done on a daily basis. And lastly, 
one of the most important things is it gives us a sense of control over our health. And everybody wants that, especially when there's so many other factors in the world that we can't control. This is the one thing that we can do every day for ourselves to make sure that we get off on the right foot. I think another reason why we feel that the use of supplements makes us healthier is because at one point there were diseases that were caused by a deficiency of a vitamin. So there were things like rickets, we had scurvy, we had goiter, all of those things were caused due to a deficiency of a certain nutrient. So it goes back as far as 1750. There was a, a British naval physician and he was out doing his thing with the sailors, sailing across the sea. And he happened to notice like, okay, these, these gentlemen over here that they're eating their oranges and their lemons, they're staying pretty healthy on this voyage. And then there was a group of men that did not eat any of the fruits and they started to have a situation where their their gums would start to bleed their skin would start to break down and eventually they would get so sick that they would die so this this physician um, his name was James Lind he kind of put two and two together and he thought hmm these guys that are having the fruit they're not getting sick there must be something in this fruit that is helping them stay healthy and at that point, vitamins didn't exist. Nobody knew about them, but he was already starting to put two and two together and recognize the correlation between eating certain things and health outcomes. So fast forward a little bit in 1913, the first vitamin was isolated and that was thiamine or B1. And then in 1924, we went ahead and we started adding iodine to table salt to prevent goiter. And I don't know if you know what goiter is, but goiter is, is the um, kind of like the swelling of the thyroid. And the thyroid is like a butterfly, butterfly shaped gland that's right underneath your Adam's apple. So people's necks would get a little bit big. And it's not something that you really see or talk about anymore. And probably the reason for that is because we do have the iodine added to our table salt. So then in 1933, vitamin D was added to milk and this was for the prevention of rickets. And rickets is the softening or weakening of bones primarily in children due to inadequate vitamin D intake. And in 1941, we started adding more vitamins into flour because as food became more highly processed, what we were doing is we were taking out the vitamins. So we had to turn around and we had to put them back in. So thus B1, riboflavin, niacin, and iron all went back into the flour to fortify it again. So we recognized that foods needed to be fortified in order to give us what our bodies needed. So someone came upon the great idea to go ahead and sell these little vitamins in their own little pill. And thus in the 1940s, multivitamin and mineral supplements entered our pharmacies and grocery stores. So fast forward from 1940 to 2011, the spending in supplements went up to $30 billion annually. So I don't know what supplements cost back in the 1940s, but $30 billion is definitely a lot of money and it only goes up from there. So in 2016, we spent just in the US, $41 billion on supplements. And it is expected by the year 2024 that we will invest $56.7 billion in our supplement use. So what are some of the more popular nutritional products? Well, the Nutrition Clinical Practice Journal states that the multivitamin mineral supplements, fish oil, glucosamine, beta carotene, B complex, selenium, vitamin E, calcium vitamin D, 
and vitamin C are some of the more popular supplements and there are many more that are coming out on the market. The FDA estimates that every year another 5,500 new products will reach our store shelves to give us more and more options. So I plan to discuss each one of these different vitamins and minerals that we've just listed. But before I do that, I do want to address um, some terminology. And this slide right here discusses what we call dietary reference intakes. And this title, dietary reference intake, is, cut, is a type of umbrella term that's used to identify specific terminology that we use to discuss the nutrients that different groups are receiving. So as I go through and talk about these different vitamins and minerals, I'll refer a lot to RDAs and upper intake levels or upper levels, I'll call them. So an RDA is basically the percentage of a specific nutrient that's provided to an individual. So it's estimated that it usually provides between 97 and 98% of what an individual needs of that particular nutrient. And then an upper level is the maximum daily intake unlikely to cause any adverse health effects. So you don't want to go over that because if you do, it could possibly make you sick. So for each nutrient, like I say, I will discuss what the RDA is and then what the upper limit is so we know what the range is where we should stay with this particular item. On the previous slide, we spoke about terminology. And on this slide, I'd like to discuss the dietary reference intakes. This chart that you're looking at was adapted from the National Institute of Health website, and it is a table that is reflective of the recommended dietary allowances. And for our convenience today, it's been modified so that it addresses just the population group that we will be speaking to today. So I've modified it to address men and women 19 years of age and older. And the way you use these tables is that you um, determine what nutrient you would like to learn a specific amount for. And down the side of the chart is what we call life stage groups. And so you select if you're a male or a female and what your age is, and then you find that row. So say for example, I was a 19 year old female and I wanted to learn how much vitamin C I should have every day. So what is the recommended dietary allowance for a 19 year old female? So I find my age in the row and then I find the column for vitamin C and where the two intersect is what the recommended dietary allowance is for that particular nutrient. So that is how you use these charts. And there are multiple charts on this site. So just be aware of which one you're looking at when you do look up whatever it is that you're, you're trying to find. So I hope this is helpful and then we'll move on to our multivitamin mineral supplements. So we've talked a little bit about terminology. We've talked about reference intakes. Now I'm finally gonna get down to the supplements themselves. So the first supplement that I mentioned was the multivitamin mineral supplement. And those are definitely the most popular ones used. Uh, amongst cancer survivors, about 40% of cancer survivors use multivitamin mineral supplements. And if you should go to the store and if you should pick up two products and hold them side by side, you'll notice that they're different. Not all multivitamin mineral supplements have the same amount of nutrients in them. So that can make selection of them a little bit confusing. And one of the reasons for this is because there's really no true standard of what can be in a multivitamin mineral supplement. Now, there are was a definition that was put out there in 2006. The Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality did state that any supplement containing three or more vitamins and minerals, no hormones, herbs or drugs, 
with all components appearing in levels less than the recommended upper level for dietary reference intakes could be considered a multivitamin mineral supplement. So that is a nice definition. I like that because what it does take into consideration is the upper levels because more is not always better. And according to the National Institute of Health, the multivitamin mineral supplements do not prevent against chronic disease or the reoccurrence of cancer. So the next supplement that we'll address is fish oil. Fish oil has a wide range of uses with chronic diseases because it assists with the reduction of inflammation. And there have been a lot of studies that have been done with them, but there hasn't been any real concluding evidence that determines that fish oil does indeed reduce cancer risk. Um, however, there is currently a study underway called the VITAL study, which stands for vitamin D and omega trial to evaluate the impact of these two nutrients on the cancer risk. And in this study, what they're doing is they're taking about one gram of omega-3 fatty acids and it's provided daily to individuals. And then they'll go ahead and evaluate what happens in a couple years. So this study is still pending, the results are. And to give you an idea, of the level of omega-3 fatty acids that are being supplemented, the recommended dietary allowance for omega-3s are 1.6 grams for men per day and 1.1 gram for women daily, with an upper limit of 4 grams per day uh, as long as you're supervised by a physician. If you're not supervised by a physician, then they would recommend three grams daily. And good food sources of omega-3 fatty acids include salmon, chia seeds, flax seed, and walnuts. And just a little side note about chia seeds. Um, chia seeds used to be the food of peasants, but it's actually a very nutrient-dense grain. It's one of the higher protein grains, and it can also be used as an egg substitute. So of a, an interesting versatile food. And then there's glucosamine. Glucosamine is used primarily for osteoarthritis, knee and joint pain, and studies haven't shown anything conclusive that it is indeed beneficial and there's no link at all with cancer prevention. And one thing I do want to mention in regards to this supplement is that it can interfere with some of the blood thinning medications like Coumadin, so that could be a potential side effect that you would want to watch for if you did indeed use this product. Beta carotene is the next vitamin on our list and it has been studied quite extensively due to its contribution to our immune function. It helps us to maintain our vision and the overall dysfunctioning of our cells. So women 19 years of age and up require about 700 micrograms daily, and my, men 19 years of age and up require about 900 micrograms daily. The upper limit for beta carotene is 3,000 micrograms per day, and it's found primarily in green and orange fruits and vegetables. On this slide, I wanted to discuss some of the studies that were done in regards to beta carotene. So there were two large trials where they supplemented individuals with this nutrient, and they found that in individuals who smoked or had exposure to asbestos, the su supplementation of beta carotene in their diet actually increased their risk of cancer. And overall, there was no benefit as far as cancer reduction for any of the population in these studies. So this next slide is about beta carotene still, but it has a different title and the title is Nutrigenomics. And what Nutrigenomics is, is the study of the bioactive food components in relationship to disease and our genetics and how, how entire foods can affect us. So the Cancer Treatment Review Study in 2010 
took two groups of people. They took smokers and they took non-smokers. Both the smokers and the non-smokers had a genetic risk for lung cancer. And both groups also consumed cruciferous vegetables. And cruciferous vegetables are broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts. So those are just some of the few examples. And what they found was that the smokers who ate the cruciferous vegetables actually had a lower risk for lung cancer. And what's so interesting about this is when I talked about the study with the smokers before who had beta carotene supplemented, they had a different result. So they actually had an increased risk for lung cancer. So what is going on here? And what the conclusion came to be was it's not just one specific nutrient in the food that can alter our reaction or prevention to certain diseases. It's the whole entire food itself. There's so many different compounds in foods that we are not even aware of today yet. So just like 200 years ago, we didn't know vitamins existed. Maybe 200 years from now, we'll discover other things in foods that we didn't even know existed, but yet offered some type of health benefit to us. So overall, the study I, I think has, op it opens up a whole new realm to us as far as what supplementation can do for us versus the use of real foods and potentially the use of something called functional foods, which I'll discuss later on in the talk. At this point, we will continue on with our vitamin supplements. And the next one on our list are the B-complex vitamins. There are a lot of B vitamins, so I have several slides to go over all the different B vitamins that you can find in a B-complex supplement. So the first one is B1, thiamine. The second one is B2, riboflavin. Then there's B3, niacin, B5, pemophenic acid. And we'll move along to our next slide that has B6, pyridoxine, B7, biotin, B9, folate, and B12, which we get primarily from animal sources or fortified foods. And the reason I want to mention this is because if you are a vegetarian or a vegan, this might be a product or a nutrient that you would want to have a product to supplement with. And being that all of the B vitamins are water soluble, they are not stored in your body, so you have to replenish them on a regular basis. And if you don't have a good appetite or you don't eat adequate amounts of food, you could be at risk for a deficiency in some of the B vitamins. The good thing about the B vitamins is, is that they are in a lot of different foods. Um, you can find them in whole grains, meat, eggs, beans, lentils, fruits, and dark green leafy vegetables. And we need our B vitamins because they give us energy. They're in so many foods because that's what we need to keep us going. There has been no indication that they actually prevent cancer or protect against it, but like I say, they keep us going and they give us the energy that we need day to day. So selenium is the next nutrient on our list and it enhances our immune system and protects against stress. There's some evidence that selenium found in foods may protect against prostate cancer, but in a study called the SELECT trial, the Selenium and Vitamin E Cancer Prevention Trial published in 2009, it was determined that selenium supplements did not assist with the reduction of prostate cancer. So the conclusion that they came to was that only when there are low levels of selenium in the body is there any benefit from supplementation. And the recommended diet dietary allowance for men and women 19 years of age and older is 55 micrograms a day. And the upper limit is 400 micrograms per day. And good sources of selenium include walnuts, saltwater fish, beef, poultry, and grains. Then there's vitamin E, 
and vitamin E protects against stress by enhancing our immune system. And it was also in the SELECT study with selenium. And what they found was as they increased levels of vitamin E, it actually increased the risk for prostate cancer. So more is not always better. And again, you know, we may need to start looking at whole foods rather than trying to isolate a specific vitamin or mineral and just concentrating on that. Now, the RDA for vitamin E is 15 milligrams per day for men and women, and the upper level is 1,000 milligrams per day. Vitamin E is found primarily in, in sources of foods that are higher in fat, such as nuts, seeds, avocado, and wheat germ. Then we have the mineral calcium. Calcium supports muscle function and the maintenance of bones and teeth, and it may offer some protection against colorectal cancer. But the concern with the mineral calcium is that if you get too high with on how much is consumed, it can actually increase your risk for prostate cancer. So you have to find a happy medium of, of what you actually should take in. So that leads us to the recommended dietary allowance, which is for women, 1,000 milligrams per day up until 50 years of age. And then when you're older than 50, you have to take in 1,200 milligrams daily. And for men, 1,000 milligrams a day is required up until the age of 70. And then you too need to increase your intake to 1200 milligrams per day. And the upper level for calcium is two and a half grams daily. Good sources of calcium include tofu, kale, milk, and almonds. Vitamin D. Vitamin D regulates bone production and protects against inflammation. The recommended dietary allowance is 15 micrograms per day for men and women up to 70 years of age. Once we're older than 70, we require 20 micrograms per day. And the upper level for vitamin D is 100 micrograms daily. So the National Institute of Health had done some studies and what they found was in regions where there is a higher sun exposure, there were reductions in specific types of cancer, specifically breast cancer. And it was also noted that all of our cells have vitamin D receptors, including cancer cells. So the National Institute of Health felt that more research needed to be done in order to evaluate the true benefit of sun exposure or vitamin D. So the study, the VITAL trial, the vitamin D and omega-3 fatty acid trial was initiated in order to evaluate the impact of these nutrients on our health. And that's something that's still in progress, but something we'll have to follow and see indeed what the outcomes are. So sources of vitamin D, if you're not a sun worshiper, you can always get them through your food, get it through your food too. So there's milk, egg, salmon, Cereals are fortified as well. And there's different conversions for vitamin D. So sometimes when you read labels, you might see it come up in like different numbers. And I put a conversion factor on this slide just in case you really want to figure it out. Um, so one microgram is equal to 40 international units. So like I said, sometimes if you look on something, it'll reflect it in international unit, and now you know how to figure that out if you want to. One of the last slides I have on vitamin D is the use of vitamin D in conjunction with calcium. There were two studies done with this combination, and they were the Women's Health Initiative in 2006 and the Nebraska Trial in 2007. And what they found was when they used these two nutrients together, there were not any significant reductions in the rate of colorectal cancer, breast, or overall cancer rate. Our last slide is the slide on vitamin C, and it's required for our skin, and it helps us metabolize nutrients, and it also builds up our immune system. 
Vitamin C is also water soluble. So it is one of those vitamins that we should try to take in on a regular basis because again, this vitamin is flushed out on a regular basis. The recommended dietary allowance for women is 75 milligrams a day if you're 19 years of age and older. And for men, it's 90 milligrams a day if you're 19 years of age and older. And the upper level is 2000 milligrams a day. As far as vitamin C in cancer, there doesn't seem to be any correlation between the intake in vitamin C and the reduction in overall cancer risk. But um, it does help protect against scurvy. So if you learn anything about vitamin C today, keep that in mind. Um, great sources of the vitamin C would be your oranges, lemons, strawberries, tomatoes, and broccoli. Well, well, we've gone through all of our supplements, but before we go any farther, I did want to discuss what an antioxidant was. An antioxidant is a substance that is either man-made or naturally produced that can prevent or delay cell damage. And examples include vitamin C, vitamin E, selenium, and beta carotene. And on this slide, there are three studies that focused on antioxidants. So that's the Physician's Health Study, um, the Supplementation of Vitamins, Minerals, and Antioxidant Trial, and the Women's Antioxidant Cardiovascular Study. And even with all these antioxidants, there was no significant reduction in the incidence of cancer in both men and women. After going through all the studies, it doesn't really seem like the more supplements you take, the better off you are. And I think there's a lot of misconceptions out there about supplements. I think a lot of people believe that the more you take of a particular vitamin, the better off you are. And they're not worried that taking more of this vitamin might hurt them because they think it's natural and that it's safe. And a lot of these foods or products that we add into our diet, they've been around for hundreds, if not thousands of years. So they figure it can't be that bad if it's been all around this long. And finally, why would the FDA ever allow something to be sold to us that is not good for us? So these are thoughts that I think come up with people, but they are actually not a means to justify the use of supplements because supplements can be dangerous just because they are natural. That doesn't mean that they're safe. And as you could see from some of the studies that we talked about earlier with regards to calcium and vitamin E and beta carotene, more is not always better. More can actually hurt you or increase your risk for cancer. This slide shows the documentation of some of the adverse events that occur with supplement use. So our supplements hit the stores back in the 1940s, and here we are, it's 2010, and about a thousand reports of adverse events were reported in that year. By 2011, this number has doubled, and by 2012, the number has almost tripled. And exposures to supplements such as vitamins, herbs, protein powders, and botanicals, that accounted for more than 100,000 calls to the U.S. Poison Control Centers in 2013. When I look at that slide and I look at the amount of adverse reactions related to supplements, it doesn't seem that alarming, especially when you take into consideration that over $40 billion are spent on supplements annually. But an important factor to think about is that when the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act went into effect in 1994, the FDA determined that the products that were sold did not require a review prior to marketing. And sellers are not required to do research studies of people to prove that what they sell actually works and is safe for people. And the manufacturers 
are the parties responsible for reporting the serious and harmful effects to the Food and Drug Administration. So only after reports are made to the Food and Drug Administration do these items become monitored and tracked. So dietary supplements are usually self-prescribed. Uh, there's usually no controls that are implemented with them and the reporting protocols are very limited. So any side effects, reactions, or drug interactions, uh, a lot of people don't know what to do with and, and many doctors don't even know that their patients are taking supplements. So supplements, they're not intended to do, like treat, diagnose, or cure anything. Um, and that's what we're supposed to use prescription drugs for. And that's why drugs are considered unsafe until proven safe by studies prior to receiving the approval of the Food and Drug Administration. So let's just review quickly how the FDA treats dietary supplements as opposed to drugs. So dietary supplements are considered food items. So they do not to they do not require confirmation of safety prior to marketing. However, drugs fall under the medication category, so they do have to be deemed safe prior to marketing. So let's just review what a medication has to go through before it reaches the market. So with medications, even the non-prescription medications, clinical trials must be done on human volunteers to determine substantial evidence that the drug is both safe and effective for its intended use. And then, once the drug is approved, it must be manufactured under carefully monitored conditions, packaged with specific instructions on the best dose, route, schedule, and a list of specific side effects that could be the result of using this product. Contraindications and unsafe interactions must be noted, and once the drug is on the market, doctors report the adverse reactions to the Food and Drug Administration. So those are the differences between how a supplement is treated versus how a medication is treated, but there still are some rules for supplements as to how they should be manufactured. So it's not as if the Food and Drug Administration has just totally disregarded um, how a supplement is produced. There still are what we call good manufacturing practices. And with that being said, products need to be produced in a quality manner and they should not contain any contaminants or impurities. And the products must be labeled with the ingredients that are actually in the product. However, the, one of the issues with the good manufacturing practices is, is that there are so many products out there that the FDA has a really difficult time keeping up with the evaluation of these practices. And since the incidents or adverse effects are reported by the manufacturers themselves, you're not sure if they actually reach the FDA and only after they reach the FDA does the FDA eventually start to track and monitor that manufacturer and the and whatever it produces. At this point I think it's clear that it's difficult for the Food and Drug Administration to keep up with all the different supplements that are on the market and to evaluate their integrity. And so there was a study that was done, it was called the Toronto study, it was done in 2013. And in this study, 44 herbal supplements that were sold in the United States and Canada were analyzed. And what they found was that only 48% of the supplements actually contained any of the ingredient listed on the label. And those that did contain the proper ingredient, they were often contaminated or had some type of filler in them. 
So how do we protect ourselves from these products that are not really what they say they are? Well, there have been some other organizations and companies that have stepped up to provide additional layer of monitoring. And they provide, when they do evaluate a product, they provide their symbol on the label so that you know there is a higher quality standard with this product. So the first symbol that I have on the left, NSF, that's an acronym that stands for the National Sanitation Foundation. And this is an international nonprofit, non-governmental organization that uh, sets standards for public health and safety. Um, now the symbol on the far right hand side, that would be the consumerlab.com. This is an independent company that tests nutritional products and the only downside with this is that you do have to pay to become a member to access the information. And I looked it up and it's about $80 for two years. But they test many of the nutritional products and it is a good site. Finally, in the middle, we have the USP symbol. This is one of the more common symbols. And this represents the US Pharmacopeia organization which is dedicated to the quality control for the strength and purity of pharmaceuticals. They began publishing their standards for dietary supplements back in 1997 and their standards are updated yearly. They do product testing and site visits for companies who participate in their program and supplement makers are not required by law again to follow these standards but Many of them have chosen to do so just because it goes ahead and, like I said, it, it provides um, an additional layer of quality for their product. So supplement makers are required to follow the good manufacturing processes by the Food and Drug Administration, but the USP symbol indicates a higher quality standard has been achieved. And I'm including this slide just as a picture to show you what you can look for on the label. So if you are trying to select a supplement product, this is what the USP code would look like on the container. Now there's some additional items that we can look for on the labels to help us understand what we're purchasing. And there's four different categories. So there's the nutrition claims, the claims of well-being, the health claims, and the structural and functional claims. And with the nutritional claims, these are statements about general effects of dietary supplements on diseases, and they're known to be caused by nutrient deficiencies. For example, vitamin C, as we talked about earlier, prevents scurvy. And not the, these claims do not need to be approved by the Food and Drug administration as they are fact but the label must state how many cases are in the u.s so we as consumers can weigh the risk of perhaps acquiring scurvy against that of taking their or using their product and uh, there are the the claims of well-being as well um, something makes you feel better and these claims do not require pre-approval by the Food and Drug Administration, just so you know. So they can say, you know, yes, this does make you feel better, but there's no proof behind that statement. As far as the health claims, these make statements about health benefits of certain um, products. For example, folic acid can reduce the risk of pregnant women delivering an infant with neural tube defect. And these claims must be pre-approved by the Food and Drug Administration. So they can't uh, put that on there unless that's been passed and approved by the Food and Drug Administration. Finally, there are the functional claims and these discuss the effect of the supplement on the structure of function on the body. None of these claims are reviewed by the FDA or the Food and Drug Administration, and thus the labels must also include a disclaimer that indicates this statement has not been approved by the FDA. This product is not intended to diagnose, treat, or prevent disease. 
And this disclaimer is needed is a lot of times, you know, people will read something and they will believe that it's true. And so that's why that's on there. It's important to note that only drugs have proven that they have a significant effect on disease states and only they can state that they do reduce arthritic pain or treat heart disease. So what if I am considering taking a dietary supplement? What, did I, what should I do? Well, one of the first things that you should do is discuss it with your physician and make sure that it will not interfere with any of the other medications that you're currently taking. So like I said before, a lot of doctors don't know that their patients are on supplements. So it's always a good place to start just to make sure everybody's on the same page Talk to your doctor before you start taking anything. And then if you do start taking a supplement or maybe you're going to take multiple supplements, make sure you introduce them one at a time because that way, should you ever have an adverse reaction, you'll know, okay, I started taking say vitamin C today and now I have this rash. So you can zone it in and see, okay, it's this particular item that's causing me to have this rash. And then you want to look things up. Uh, the National Institute of Health has a great back page for supplements, and that's coming up here on the next slide. I'll, I'll give you that reference. And do a little bit of investigating. Look it up, see, you know, what is stated about the particular product, and, and determine is it really worth it to me or you know maybe I should just try to go without it and finally look for higher levels of standards the USP or the NSF symbol on the label this slide is a screenshot of the National Institute of Health website where you can go to to look up some more information on supplements if you're interested so I hope this is helpful if you decide to go there this slide we've seen before, this is the slide reviewing the dietary reference intakes. And if you remember, the dietary reference intakes term is an umbrella term that's used to describe some of the definitions for other levels of intake. And the first one that we see on the left-hand side, the estimated average requirements, this term is what is used for large populations of people because I don't know if you remember back to the beginning of the presentation where we looked at um, different categories, different age groups, different sexes, and that helped us to then determine the amount of a specific vitamin or nutrient that we would need. So when you have a large group, you're not able to do that. So what they do with this is they, they make an average. And so these requirements meet um, the, the needs of 50% of healthy individuals. Then when we move on to the next, the next term, which is the recommended dietary allowances, these are determined on a, an individual's specific age and sex. So it's much more accurate. So when you look at a recommended dietary allowance, this will meet the requirements primarily 97 and 98% of what an individual will need. And then we have the adequate intakes. Now, adequate intakes are used when they can't really determine what is needed. So the way they work this is, is they just tell you what you should get so that you don't have a deficiency. So that is the what the adequate intake is. And we've also discussed previously the tolerable up, upper intake levels, and that is the maximum daily intake an individual should have in order not to acquire any adverse health effects. Well, these people on this slide look excited, and I think they're excited because they're sitting down to eat a well-balanced meal, and they feel good about what they're going to have. And I hope that everyone feels good about how they eat and in order to determine that we are eating well-balanced meals, I do have a diet quiz set up that we can take to help us evaluate how we're doing. 
And before we start the quiz, I would like to give you a key as to how to evaluate how you do. So for every question that you answer, give yourself two points if you say yes. If you answer sometimes to a question, give yourself one point. And if you answer no to a question, give yourself zero points. So if you have a pen and paper handy, that would be great because then what you can do is you can add the points up as you go along. And then at the end of the quiz, we'll total up our points and we'll use that total to evaluate the quality of our diet. Well, here we go. Let's get started on our quiz. I eat two or more servings of vegetables each day. Examples are, but are not limited to, a half a cup of broccoli, a half a cup of carrots, a half a cup of zucchini, one tomato. Yes, sometimes no. I eat one serving of a vitamin A rich food each day. And I don't know if you remember from when we talked about vitamin A earlier on, but dark green or orange fruits and vegetables are great sources of vitamin A, and some examples are carrots, spinach, squash, and mango. Yes, sometimes no. I eat two or more servings of fruit each day. Examples of fruit would be, but are not limited to, banana, mango, apples, and grapes. Yes, sometimes no. I eat one serving of vitamin C rich food each day. Examples could be citrus fruits or they could be oranges, grapefruits, tomatoes, fruit juices, strawberries, cantaloupe or coleslaw. Yes, sometimes no. <clears throat> I drink two glasses of low fat milk each day or I eat two servings of low fat dairy foods each day. So. Uh, this could be cheese or yogurt, or if you're a vegan, you could use a dairy alternative like silk. Um, and let's see, you could say yes, sometimes, or no. I eat at least two servings of lean meat, fish, poultry, dried beans, peas, or nuts each day. Yes, sometimes, or no. I eat no more than three to four eggs each week. Yes, sometimes, no. I eat four or more servings of breads, cereals, rice, noodles, or pasta each day. Yes, sometimes, no. I eat whole grain breads and cereals. Yes, sometimes, no. I eat no more than one serving of cake, cookies, pastries, baked goods, or candy each day? Yes, sometimes no. For me, that would be a seasonal question. It would depend on what time of the year it was. Um, the next question, I limit my use of salt and salty foods each day. Example, ham, bacon, snack chips, pickles, canned or dried soup. Yes, sometimes no. I limit my use of fats and oils each day. So examples of fats would be butter, margarine, salad dressing, fried foods. Yes, sometimes no. I drink no more than two alcoholic beverages each day. Examples of these beer, wine, cocktail. Yes, sometimes no. I eat breakfast. Yes, sometimes no. I eat when I'm hungry, but not when and not when the clock says it's meal time. Yes, sometimes no. I snack. Yes, sometimes no. Great, we're done with the quiz. So now let's take this opportunity to add up all your points to see how you did. So if you scored between 26 and 32 points, you're doing great. Your, your diet is right on track. If you were between 17 and 25 points, you're not bad. There's just a little bit of room for improvement. Between nine and 16 points, you might want to sit down and, and assess where you can improve 
uh, your intake in different areas. And finally, if you are eight points or less, you got a lot of work to do. We probably need to sit down and evaluate some different techniques to get a wider variety of foods into your diet. So anyway, great job. Thanks for doing that. Well, if you took that diet quiz and you determined that you need to improve your diet, I have some recommendations here for you from the American Institute for Cancer Research and the World Cancer Research Fund. And they suggest that we strive for five, five servings of non-starchy fruits and vegetables every day, or about 14 ounces, which is a little less than two cups. They also suggest that we eat unprocessed cereals or pulses, which are legumes with meals, and ask that we limit our intake of processed meat. Processed meat would be like bacon, sausage, and limit our red meat intake to less than 18 ounces per week. And the significance with red meat is, is there's the type, of, the type of iron that's in red meat, and that correlates with an increased risk for colorectal cancer. They also suggest that we monitor our alcohol consumption. So men, no more than two drinks a day, and women, no more than one drink a day. And we want to watch our sodium intake. So less than 2,400 milligrams per day is what is suggested. And there seems to be a correlation between a higher sodium intake and stomach cancer. So that's why they, they really suggest the lower intake of the salt. So we want to try to meet all of our nutritional needs through diet alone. And all the foods that we put into our mouth need to be nutrient dense, fresh, unprocessed as much as possible. So with that being said, it's also suggested that we avoid fast foods. And that's because the fast foods tend to be very highly processed, high in salt, high in fat, high in sugar, high in calories, and empty and everything else. So those are the recommendations, again, from the American Institute for Cancer Research and the World Cancer Research Fund. Another tool that you could use to help improve your diet would be the plate method. And this is one of my favorite tools. It's very basic, but it's very helpful and the way it works is that you have a regular size plate and you divide it up into different sections. So half of your plate should be fruits and vegetables. A quarter of your plate should be some type of grains, preferably about half of them unprocessed. And a quarter of your plate, some type of protein with dairy two to three times daily. And you could use a dairy alternative if you wanted to several times a day. And you can go to the website, choosemyplate.gov. Here you can go ahead and review the 2015 through 2020 dietary guidelines. And you can scroll down and there's a section that I really like. It's called My Plate Kitchen. And from there, you can go into that category and you can put in the subject that you would like to learn more about. So for example, say I wanted to find more foods that were higher in calcium, then I would just, there's like a little drop down arrow, I would look in there and I would click on calcium and it would give me recipes and suggestions for getting more of that in my diet. If I were a vegan and I wanted more options for that, I could go into that category and it would give me recommendations. So this is a wonderful resource and you could spend a lot of time on here. I know I have, so uh, I hope you give it a try. And I think if you do, you would really enjoy it. The last tool I would like to give you in order to help you improve your diet would be a review of the nutrition facts label. So new labels started coming out on the store shelves as of this past January. The nutrition labels have been updated now. It was 20 years, but now the new nutrition labels are finally updated and starting to come out and they've made some great changes. 
one of the first things that they've addressed are portion sizes. What they've realized is that people are not eating the portion sizes that are listed on the labels. So they asked the manufacturers to go ahead and make changes to provide portion sizes that are actually what people eat. So for example, ice cream, the portion size used to be a half cup, but they've realized that people don't eat just a half a cup of ice cream, they eat more like two thirds of a cup. So on the new labels, there will be two thirds cup serving size for ice cream. And the serving size and the servings per container, this area is bigger and bolder, so it's easier to read. And the same is true for calories. As we move down into the column where fat is documented, the percent of daily calories from fat has been eliminated. What they want us to concentrate on is the type of fat that we eat. So they still list the saturated, the trans, and cholesterol. Um, if you look down under total carbohydrate, they've now included added sugars because as the foods are more highly processed, more and more of syrup and other kinds of sugars are being added to the products, and we know that when we have too much or uh, too high of an intake of added sugars, it's difficult for us to keep our caloric intake down and it's difficult for us to meet our nutritional requirements with, if we have too many calories coming from carbohydrate or from empty calories from sugar. Also, the vitamins and minerals that were required to be listed on the label are different. So it used to be that we needed to, they, they needed to list vitamin A and C, but now they've changed that because there aren't many Americans that are truly deficient in vitamin A and C. So they've gone ahead, they've dropped those two vitamins and they've added vitamin D and potassium because they found that Americans tend to have a lower intake of these two nutrients. So those are some of the changes that you'll see on the labels and I hope this was helpful for you. So when you go into the store then you can start to review these and get a better idea of how you're doing. Then we have functional foods. And functional foods are another means in order to get more vitamins and minerals and nutrients in our diet. So if we're eating certain foods and we are still missing our goals for certain nutrients, then functional foods may be the bridge that we need in order to achieve what we would like to have as a intake level. So functional foods are whole foods along with fortified, enriched, or enhanced foods that have the potential to benefit health when consumed as part of a varied diet on a regular basis and result in adequate nutrient levels. So there are three categories of functional foods. We have the conventional foods, the modified or fortified functional foods, and then the enhanced functional foods. And the conventional functional foods are just regular foods that have a lot of nutrients in them. So our fresh fruits and vegetables, our whole grains, our dairy products, um, meat, fish. There's minimal processing with conventional foods. They, these foods primarily come in their own packaging. The only modifications that might be done would be dairy products would be pasteurized or perhaps the meat might be cut up. And these foods are found primarily on the perimeter of the grocery store. So if you shop the perimeter of the store, more than likely you'll get most of the healthy foods that you need. Now, if you do have to go down the aisles to get foods that have a longer shelf life, in order to maintain a longer shelf life, more modifications will need to be made to the foods. So. Um, that can be good and that can be bad. There are modified and fortified foods that you would find 
going down the aisles and some of the better alternatives would be breakfast cereals. So most breakfast cereals are enhanced with um, iron and other B vitamins and so they are a very good example of a fortified food. You, you could also see um, margarines that are fortified with plant sterols in order to help people reduce their cholesterol levels. Another example would be orange juice that's fortified with calcium. So these are all suggestions or examples of modified or fortified functional foods. And then lastly, we have our enhanced functional foods. And these are a category that have a type of fiber that's added or a type of carbohydrate that's added that's not digestible. So right now, probiotics are a big industry. And what we do is um, they've been adding these carbohydrates that are not digestible to foods in order to feed the probiotics. So an example of an enhanced food would be maybe some yogurt that has something called inulin, which is a type of, of fiber that's added to it that works in conjunction with the probiotics in order to make your digestive tract healthier and to um, it just improved digestion in general. So these are all the examples of the different types of functional foods that you may encounter while you shop. I really like this slide because I feel like it's very informative in regards to how unprocessed foods can give you more nutrition than processed foods. On the food labels, you know, they're addressing the added sugars we know that as we process food more, it removes some of the vitamins and minerals that we actually need. And I think this slide can be a great reference as to how easy it is to make simple adjustments and make big improvements in our vitamin and mineral intake. So on the left-hand side of this slide, I have um, a fresh avocado nutrient review and then Below that, it's the plain yogurt, and that reviews the nutrients in that product. On the right-hand side, we have mayonnaise and pudding. So let's say, for example, it's lunchtime, and I'm trying to decide what I want to put on my sandwich, and I'm trying to decide what I want for dessert. Well, if I were to look at this chart, I think that on my sandwich, rather than adding mayonnaise that doesn't have any of these pretty colored bars going up, I would choose the avocado that has lots of pretty colorful bars that are coming up fairly high that are reflective of all the vitamins and minerals that are in that particular food. So that makes it easy for me to choose. I just look between those two. The same holds true for the plain yogurt in regards to the pudding. So when I compare those two side by side, again, these reference bars for vitamin and mineral content are much higher in the plain yogurt as compared to the pudding. So I think I would want to go with the plain yogurt. And you might be sitting there going, well, why would I want plain yogurt for dessert? That doesn't sound as good as pudding. But if you wanted to, you could go ahead and you could add in some additional fresh fruit and that would add more flavor and that would only contribute more vitamins and minerals to your, your yogurt profile there. So at this point, we've gone through some of the tools that are available to improve your diet and some of the methods in order to evaluate the foods that we eat. And so we just need to know every day what we should do. And if you ever have any questions, refer back to the American Institute for Cancer Research and Dietary Recommendations. Then we also have the plate method that reviews the 2015 and 2020 dietary guidelines. 
Don't forget to use your nutrition labels. So as you're out and about shopping, start to become more comfortable with what you see on the containers of all the different foods that you select. And remember that those functional foods are available to you if you feel that you are eating fairly well, but there are perhaps a few areas where you're falling short and then you can use these items to help you meet your daily requirements for vitamins and minerals. And this slide again states the same thing that I just said on the previous slide, but in a picture version because I'm a visual person. I like, I think I learned more through pictures. So I wanted to include this as well. So basically at the bottom of our food pyramid, we want to have a healthy balanced diet that's primarily plant-based. If we have difficulty meeting our requirements, then we can try to utilize functional foods more. And if for some reason we have specific dietary restrictions that are keeping us from meeting the recommended dietary allowances on a regular basis, then at that time we can look to supplements to close that gap. I love the picture of, on this slide and it just represents the whole theme of this talk and that is to let food be thy medicine and let medicine be thy food. So in conclusion, the American Institute for Cancer Research and the World Cancer Research Fund recommends meeting nutritional needs by diet alone. And dietary supplements are not recommended for cancer prevention. So if you think back to the beginning of this lecture, as we reviewed all the different studies with the different vitamins and minerals, there were no conclusive studies that did indicate that the dietary supplements were beneficial in reducing the frequency or recurrence of cancer. Also, obtaining nutrients from foods that work together to protect us from cancer is the preferred option. And use of functional foods could assist with acquiring adequate levels of nutrient intake if, it, if needed or if intake is limited. Finally, use of supplements can be beneficial for those individuals that are unable to obtain adequate levels of nutrients through diet alone. So I hope this has been helpful for you and I am very grateful that you spent an hour of your day with me here today and I hope the remainder of your day goes very well. Thank you so much.